Okay, that uh, will make you relaxed, that music. Number 417, day by day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. I have no cause for worry or for fear. We've heard that a couple times this week. No need for worry or for fear. We need to be reminded of that all the time. Number 417. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. I know cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he gives best. Loving thee is part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day. Self is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares seem faint or bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his solid treasure. Is a charge on himself we lay. As thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me made. Help me then in every tribulation. So to trust thy promises, O oh Lord, that I may not face with consolation, offer thee within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble there to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days of home is fleeting, till I reach the promised land. There's something about that hymn I've always enjoyed ever since I first sung it. Really a thoughtful word, and I always like that phrase. It says that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. You know, sometimes we uh, don't take advantage of these promises that God has provided for us. We forget them. We don't call them to mind. 
And so we lose faith's sweet consolation. So the hymn writer here, which was Sandell, uh, reminds us that we shouldn't lose that sweet consolation. Okay, how about number 384? Number 384, what a friend we have in Jesus. <coughs> All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Again, sure. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Mm. We know he is a friend that we, we learn from your word who sticks closer than a brother. Amen. So we thank you for him, for his love for us, for his great finished work on the cross of Calvary. Thank you as the tomb is empty and we have the hope of seeing him and being with him again some glad day. We just ask that you would bless our time together, bless our brother Brian as he opens your word. Give him an unction from your Holy Spirit that we might hear from you, from your words, and you would plant it deep in our hearts so we might be more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his blessed and precious name, for his glory we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dennis. Appreciate that. Okay, we're going to take favorites in just a moment, but I have a couple of announcements first. But if you have a favorite, uh, let me know what that would be. Uh, we were glad today to have Eddie Anthony come. He's the prophet from another country. So he, uh, Got the uh, extra benefit here of a, of a uh, what do you call it, the screen up on high or whatever. <laughs> no, we uh, actually, I, like I said before, I was sitting there and I'm saying, you know, I need to get that screen up on a table there. And I, I probably had that thought in my mind and then Ed came over and we started talking and he says, no, I got to get that thing up there. So really it generated that whole thought from you, Brian, just so you're not, don't have a, you know, go away with the bitter, you know, remember the root of bitterness you talked about today? You remember that, right? <laughs> okay, I don't want you to have it. and many of us get the file from it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, 
So it was nice to have Ed with us. And for those that went down to the LBI Museum, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed so much. And so many people did as well. Very knowledgeable. Um, I don't know what you call him, a docent or an interpreter or whatever. Very knowledgeable, very nice time. If you ever have that opportunity, if you're in the area, we really recommend that. It was a very nice uh, little stop that we had this afternoon. And a great sunset. Now, originally in the program, I had listed Red Sails at Sunset uh, photo op. So that sounded a little bit worldly, so I just said the photo op, you know, for this. But it was a nice sunset tonight. We didn't have that the other day. So uh, it's good that everybody was taking their pictures with the tune, the nice tune of Sarah Cook playing on the bagpipes. Boy, that really added the effect to it. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Okay, James. James wants me to make an announcement. What's that announcement, James? What? Sign language? Yes. Okay, James wanted me to announce that there's a there's a sale on the shelves. They're now free of charge. <laughs> and he wants you to take them home. <laughs> so if you want some shelves, you can take them home. Uh, and if you are thinking, what do I do with shelves? Well, James put a poster up over there. This is what you can do with those shelves. You can paint them. You can give them to friends. You can what? Hide them, right? Do they say that? Hide them? Okay, it's got a lot of different... A soap dish. Okay, that's a good idea. Soap dish. That's good. Yes. There's a woman in New Jersey who's putting Bible verses on the inside of the shelves right. and dropping them wow. Wow. all around the state. Wow. And, that's neat. And, and if you find one, you're supposed to sign it and either put it back in the water or another location, or you can keep it as a souvenir. But it's something to be believed. Wow. I found two of them so far. Well, one down here, obviously, one up in Ocean Grove. Wow. So, you know, we need to be creative, right? You can put a Bible verse in there and put it back on the beach. Somebody finds it. Who knows? They'll say, wow, I was uh, sent by God to pick up this plan show. Who knows what will happen? Boy, that's an idea. Yeah. So many different things we really can be doing. We put our minds to being creative, right, with the gospel. So uh, that's uh, thanks for uh, letting us know that, Rich. Okay, so these games are in the back right there. The answers are back there. And uh, you can you go back there and avail yourself of those. Uh, they are there. Also, this key was back there. It looks to me like a luggage key. It may not be, but if you lost a luggage key, now maybe it's not part of our group, I don't know, but it's on this you know, little holder right there. So if you think you might have lost a luggage key, you probably don't realize that you lost it. Just come by and take a look at it, and uh, maybe it's the luggage key we were to your luggage, we don't know. Okay, um, yes, what, James? What's your announcement number two? <laughs> oh yes, James has created a YouTube channel. He calls it the Hill Street Channel. Okay, that's where we live, Hill Street. Okay, and he does put some really good music on there. He can, he can handle the YouTube uh, really well and has a lot of good programs to it. So. Oh, she just got, she just got added. Oh, Sarah Cook, you're going to go viral. Just, uh, yeah, you're going to go around the world. So in order for that to happen, you have to subscribe to James's channel. Yeah, right. Hit the, notif hit the notification bell. That's uh, so anything that's added new, you get notified instantly. The younger generation, they're on top of this, right? <laughs> Some will be a premiere and some will not be a premiere. Okay, got it. Okay, that's your two announcements. You're good. You're good. You'll, you'll be monetized, I'm sure, in, a, in no time flat. If you don't know what monetized means, it says if you get a lot of subscribers, you get money for it. <laughs> but I don't think you get millions of subscribers, but it's okay. You're doing it as a ministry to the Lord, not doing it for money. Right, okay. So anyway, that's uh, James wanted you to know that. And thanks, James. James has put a lot of good work on that. It's fun to see that. We had that bus travel around with different people, and James has made these playlists. And at Christmas time, get the words up there for the songs. It's really fun to see some of those things. Okay, who's got a favorite? Yes, Ruth. Uh, three. Okay, hey Ruth, you threw your voice wonderfully. That's a great. You sound a little deep. What do you have? Frog in your throat? Okay, three oh nine. He says three oh nine. We'll start with three oh nine. And I look at him, and I expect a higher voice from him. Number 309, number 309. 
Okay, so we get through some of these. We'll sing one, three, and five. Ready? There's within my heart a melody speaks of the sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace speaks of in a bowl of step and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Stanza three. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting in the sheltering wind. Always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. As I go, and the last, soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wait my flight to the world unknown. I shall wait with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Okay, Kevin, what is your favorite? No. Play along. 131. Thank you, Kevin. 131. Okay. Christ return, maybe morn when the day is awakening, 131, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of the world and receive from the world as 131. It may be at morn when the day is awakening, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of morning. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, every shout of that song. Christ returned, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may be perchance that the blackness of midnight will burst into light. In the flames of its glory, when Christ has received his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, every shout the glad song, Christ returned, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Oh, joy, oh, delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dreading, no crying. Caught up through the crowd. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, every shout of that song, Christ returned, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, amen. Okay, great song reminding of the world's return. All right, well, we're privileged this 
we to have with us as one of our guests, Sam and Beth Cairns. They're from Canada. And Sam is the uh, yeah, the title president. Is it the president or whatever? It's a chief guy at a at an organization called Gospel Folio Press. And some of you are familiar with that ministry, that uh, book that I mean, that company that publishes many books and resources for the Lord's people. So I've asked Sam to come up here and just take a few minutes and explain uh, what that organization is all about, so you're aware of it, and then give a little bit of the background as well. So Sam, I'm going to invite you to come on up here and uh, tell us a little bit about that. And we'll have another song, and then we'll have Brian. Okay, some of you uh, already heard part of my story because I think I mentioned some of these things before. And so if you did, that's fine. But I'm not, I don't have any notes, so uh, maybe I'll tell you something different. Um, I'd like to tell you that uh, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. Uh, Gospel Folio Press started in 1923, and today is 2023. It all started back in about 1900. And that was when the Pell family came from the Netherlands and they landed in the United States and they went to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they were on the outskirts of the city at that point in what was really kind of country. And it was between two hills. And uh, they had goats and chickens and whatever else to kind of help support them and feed the family. And as the family grew, uh, from, I think there was maybe two when they came from the Netherlands and they ended up with 10 children. And uh, a couple of them uh, were disabled, but they all were dedicated to serving the Lord. And I have met a lot of families in my little life. And as I get older, I keep on meeting families, but there's very few that would measure up to the, their dedication to serving the Lord. And I was telling somebody today that uh, Lois kind of ended up being the kitchen uh, lady and the cook, and she could cook. And uh, a lot of the things that were left over and she recycled, and uh, we would have for a meal, it always tasted better than the first time. But if you said to her, that was a delicious meal, Lois, she said, oh, no, it was Tilly. Tilly baked uh, the, the bread, and she gave the rolls. You know, they always passed the glory on to somebody else, but they were a very dedicated family. They came with nothing. Uh, Mr. William Pell, senior, came across the Atlantic with his cattle, a big storm. He lost his cattle. And when he landed in the U.S., he was bankrupt. So they had nothing. And uh, he was there for a little while by himself. Finally, he was able to get some money and get some of the rest of the family to come over and join them. And he went into the painting and wallpapering business and would try to support the family with that. And of course they had their goats and their chickens and whatever else that would help support that. And Bill Pell, uh, he was the older son. And so he used to go to help his dad. And he just could not see them throwing out all the scrap paper. And so when they were papering a room and there was a white or off white paper uh, that they were putting on, he would pick up all the scraps and he would take them home and he would cut them into little squares and he would print gospel verses on the squares of the wallpaper and then go down on the weekend on the street and pass out these verses of scripture. And of course, there's no way of measuring what the results of that effort was. Someone heard about that and thought, well, we can save some time for him to do it by hand. It takes quite a while and we'll get him a little hand press and you can set the type in the hand press put the squares in because they're all the same size and then just crank the press. And that way you're printing John 316, by the way, was the first little text that was printed. And uh, that seemed to work very well. And then someone else heard that, oh, uh, there's a better way than that. We can get a bigger print press and instead of cranking it, we can just run it by electricity. And that way we can print other things. And so they started to print not only the verses of scripture, but they had a real interest in outreach. And so they started to print gospel tracts. And then when somebody heard that they could print gospel tracts, well, okay, you can print little booklets for us. 
And then there was a magazine that came out and they said, well, if you can print that and that, you can do a magazine too. And so they started to print a little magazine. Finally, they sat down and said, you know, Bill, you really should have a name for this. Well, he didn't really know what to call it. He never even thought about a name. I mean, he was just trying to serve the Lord and do whatever he could. And finally, I lost my sheet of paper. Just a mission. That's it. Yeah. And so uh, they sat down and they started to talk about it. And he thought, well, if I'm only doing gospel tracts and I'm doing it on a sheet of paper and a tract is folded, it's gospel and it's folded and it's printed on a press. Oh, gospel, folio, press. And so that's where the name came from. And so that name has been going around for over a hundred years. And uh, there's no real reason to change it, but it's still one of the best kept secrets, I think in the world, to know that a little uh, place in the valley between two hills in Grand Rapids, Michigan started the ministry and uh, started to supply materials for all over the world. And of course, if you do magazines, you can do books. And so they started to print books. Well, then they heard about John Ritchie in Scotland and said, well, we should carry the product that John Ritchie carries in Scotland and we could distribute throughout North America. Well, then they struck up a deal that John Ritchie would supply Gospel Folio Press with material and Gospel Folio Press would supply John Ritchie with material. And so that worked out very well. And any other publishers that printed good uh, scripturally sound material they brought in and would distribute it in North America. So think about this now, a hundred years ago, they're doing all this international work. They've gone through two world wars. They've gone through a depression. They've gone through several recessions and gospel folio press is still going on. The Lord preserved it, the Lord provides for it. And it's just kind of a mystery. And so we've picked up the heritage of something that the Pell family started way back in that little place outside the city of Grand Rapids, which is now, it's really, really great, the center where it was before. And that ministry started this solo. They uh, had a vision for the future and they really wanted to serve the Lord by serving the Lord's people. And so that mission has never changed. That's still our mission. And our mission is to make sure that the material is scripturally sound, make sure that it's something that will be uh, beneficial to the Lord's people and make it available to whoever wants it. And so we do quite a bit of work between different publishers. I'll buy from, like I said, John Ritchie and John Ritchie buys from us and we can exchange material back and forth that way. So then they had a real interest in children. And there's many stories that could be told about that. But I'm not going to get into all those stories. But I am going to invite you to order a book that we just published for our 100th anniversary. And it's called The Hillside of Blessings. And Jay put that together. And we just had it printed. And it came in a week before I came down here. I haven't actually sat down and read the whole thing myself. And uh, there's all kinds of stories in there how the Lord used the Pell family, not only in children's work, but in gospel work. Peter Pell was the brother to Bill. And him and uh, Bill went around and they did a lot of ministry. And they did a lot of teaching on the tabernacle. And they had models of the tabernacle that they would set up and have these meetings on the tabernacle. They were also involved in Sunday school superintendent and Sunday school teacher meetings and conferences, which we don't have anymore. But they had a big interest in children. And so they used to come to Toronto in Canada and used to go to different places and have these Sunday school teacher superintendent uh, conferences. And Bill and Peter would go around and talk to them and say, now, what could we do to help you teach children uh, each Sunday? It's a big job, you know. And so they said, we need something to help us 
make sure that we're presenting the scripture in a scriptural way. And so I used to teach Sunday school in Halifax back a few years ago, like say 60, 65 years ago. And it was, I used to get this little booklet. And this little booklet had a verse in there that you should read. It had a message of how you could present what that verse meant. And then it would have a memory verse for the children. Not that straight. Because all of us, you know, that are involved in Sunday school work, we're busy all week. And then all of a sudden on Saturday night, we say, oh, I got to teach Sunday school tomorrow. And oh, I'll talk about John on the way. Or I'll talk about David Goliath. Or I'll talk about whatever. And you and I both know that's not the right way to do it. And so this helped us as teachers to prepare to present the lesson. Well, that worked out very well. Then the women got involved. Uh, Grace Pell was the oldest. And she was kind of a big support to Bill Pell in making decisions as to what to do moving forward. And that she was actually the one that was running Gospel Holy Book Press. She looked after all the administration work and she kind of kept Bill in line. They used to go down to the Mel Trotter Mission in Grand Rapids. There would be maybe 250, 300 men come in there. And if they wanted a meal or wanted to stay overnight, they had to stay for the service. So Bill Pell would go down and speak to these men. Well, then there was quite an interest. So Grace would go down and have Bible studies in the morning with uh, some of the men, but mostly women. And Mr. Trotter used to sit behind the curtain and he'd listen to Grace as she would present the study, the Bible study. And he told Bill one day, he said, Bill, he said, Grace, if she was a man, she'd put you out of business <laughs> because he felt that she was even a better teacher than he was. So Grace was very, very involved in Gospel for the Press. She went to a conference in Buffalo, New York. She stayed with Abigail Luff. And Abigail Luff was very involved with uh, retirement homes. And back then, if you didn't have the money, you went to the poor farm. Well, they certainly didn't want any of the Lord's people to go to the poor farm. So Grace and Bill were talking about this, but they had no money. And they were at this conference. And Abigail, and she just was assigned to stay with Abigail Grace, uh, Luff to me. And so they talked about it during the weekend. And on the way out, Abigail said to Grace, we could kind of pray about that, couldn't we? And so Grace said, sure, that'd be good. Short time later, uh, they decided that they would open a retirement home and they opened Rest Haven Homes. And so that's, I'm just telling you that to tell you that the Pell family had an interest in the Lord's people and how to serve the Lord's people. Well, then Bill comes up with an idea. He thinks that there should be some kind of a devotional sent out to the Lord's people, that the Lord's people would be uh, like a devotional, something to motivate them to get into the word of God and to have a meditation that could be an encouragement, or if they're going through a difficult time, that might be something that would comfort them. And so he thought he would put together a devotional. This was in 1939. And everybody said, don't bail. That's crazy. Nobody's going to want that. How are you going to do that? And Bill says, well, I'll do the first print run of 800 because I think I have about 800 friends. And so that first devotional came out in a little form like this. We call it the best calendar now, but it's a little, you can't see it from back there, but it has the calendar for the month. It has the date. It has the verse of scripture. It has a meditation and it has a poem on the bottom. And so every morning when they get up or at noon or before you go to bed, you can look at the devotion for the day and you can see the verse, you can see the meditation. And so often people send in a little note to us and say, you know, on this particular day, I was having a difficult time. I read the meditation and it was just what the Lord wanted me to see or hear that day. And so that keeps us going. The next year, it was called Encourager. Well, that was not a very catchy name. 
And so the name was changed to Choice Cleanings. And that's what we call it today, Choice Cleanings. And so uh, there it is. This is the 2024 edition. Now, this is the best one. We have a wall style. We have a journal, which we, we had a lot of requests for large print. And so the journal is large print for those of us that are getting older and can't find our glasses and we can read the big print. And then you can journal your comments or thoughts down on the bottom of that page. Then we have a planner, a little a smaller planner, and that keep for all your appointments and stuff. Meditations are all the same. So here we are, 1940, 84 years later. Here we are with the, the same devotional calendar. The only thing that has changed is that Bill had a problem getting people to help him with the idea. So over the years, that's all, all changed. And now we have contributors who write their meditations and send them in to us. Your conference chairman happens to be one of the contributors and very faithful every year. Brian Gunning, your speaker, he's one of the contributors. And George Ferrier is another one. So you got three contributors right here. But we end up usually every year with about 40 contributors who send in their meditations and then we put them together so they're available. So there's a 2024 one. The place kept growing. I went down to uh, visit my daughter who was working at Gospel Folio. I would happen to be in meet meetings in London, Ontario, so it wasn't that far across the border. And I looked around and I thought there's so much that could be done here. And so I started sharing my ideas with someone. And I got a little invitation saying, when are you going to implement it? Which meant that I could come down on a temporary basis and maybe help me. So I decided I would maybe volunteer and do that. So I traveled back and forth. My address was 8A on Northwest Airlines for about a year. And uh, it was temporary. Well, then we decided maybe we should move. And so we relocated and went to Grand Rapids in 1996. I've been looking 27 years. So my temporary is still temporary. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be there. But Gospel Folio Press is very interested in trying to serve the Lord's people, trying to work for the Lord, do what we can for him, publish books from manuscripts, and get them printed. And right now we carry a stock of about 6,900, 7,000 titles. And I just had uh, an inventory done of our outer print, uh, uh, outer print. Uh, used in outer print books. And I think the number is around 2,200. 15 minutes up. Just that. Just okay. Brian, yeah, can, Brian can go for another half hour. Yeah, that's the thing. Anyway, I think I've told you almost enough. I, I, only I would like to say that we outgrew Grand Rapids. They were working out of a double car garage. And then when I went down there, we expanded, rented uh, two more outside satellite warehouses. and when somebody's order came in, we didn't know which warehouse that stock might be in. And so we wanted more space. There was a Christian in Port Colborne, Ontario, in the assembly there, and he heard that we were looking for warehouse space. So I get a phone call one day saying, Sam, I hear you're looking for warehouse space. I've got warehouse space. And so I didn't even know what Port Colborne was. And so we, we worked out an arrangement to relocate and the board for about a year before that had been talking about relocating from the States to Canada. And uh, at that point, the exchange rate was 1.5 and our expenses were beyond Canadian dollars. And we were shipping maybe 80% of our stock back into the States. So it all seemed to make good sense. And it was the Lord that provided the warehouse because we wouldn't have found the one close to the border. And so we've relocated there in 2001, August the 1st, just got nicely set up and operated. And then we had September 11 and everything changed. And it made it very difficult to get stock shipped across the border because everything tightened up with Homeland Security. But we've been there since 2001 and that's where we operate from. So I would suggest that you look at the Hillside of Blessings and you're gonna get the story in more detail and lots of other stories of how the pels were used by God to bring gospel messages. If you want to hear one, 
Bill was going to a conference. He used to pick up hitchhikers and he knew if he got them in the car, he would have them long enough to he could present the gospel to them. So he stopped one day on the way to Detroit to a conference and picked up a hitchhiker. The guy got in the back seat. Bill thought that's kind of strange. He wanted him to get in the front seat, but he got in the back seat and they were driving along. And Bill, of course, witnessed to him and told you know, the gospel. The guy in the back seat, hitchhiker, he says, well, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Detroit. Bill says, well, where are you going? He says, well, I'm going to Detroit too. And Bill said, well, I'll take you wherever you're going in Detroit. He says, I'll, I'll take you there. And uh, they had a little bit of a conversation. The guy in the back seat had no idea that there could be somebody that would be so kind to take him to an address in Detroit that didn't even know. So anyway, Bill delivered him. When he came back from the conference on Monday, they were cleaning the car like they normally did. And when they were cleaning the back seat, they found a revolver. The, the hitchhiker had intended to stop somebody, shoot them, take their money, take their car, and leave them in the ditch. But because Bill showed such loving kindness to him, he couldn't do it. But what the hitchhiker didn't know was that the revolver fell out of his pocket and it was down between the cushion and the back seat. But they're just stories and stories and stories like that that uh, we've heard so many sitting around the table in the bell home that we're amazed. We say, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. But yeah, it did. And so God continued to use the bells. And God has continued to use gospel folio. And we're trying to be a blessing to the Lord's people. I could tell you more. I could take more time, but Mark won't let me. I hear. The, I, I think the mat's going to move. So, thank you for listening. Yeah, what I appreciate about Gospel Folio Press is their commitment to quality uh, literature. And uh, in this day and age, you know, some of it just boils to, down to money making. And whatever title is out there that's popular, even if it's not biblical, but it looks like it might be biblical or spiritual sounding, a lot of Christian publishers will take those titles on because it's a moneymaker. But Gospel Folio Press is not interested in having that type of ministry. They want to make sure the word of God is presented. So it's a great organization. God has had his hand upon that ministry for 100 years now. And one thing you, uh, I've heard you say before, M.R. DeHaan would come down there and Billy Graham would come down and meet with the Bells. And so they've had a major influence in Christian circles. So this is a great ministry. So thanks, Sam, for that. And if you have questions about any of these resources, the website and how to order uh, these resources, you can talk to Sam afterwards. Okay, before Brian comes up, I'll take another minute or two. We're going to have a special music number. And that's not you, Rich, not this time. We've enjoyed all your music. Isn't Rich been really great? Coach Paul slaps his name back there. He knows it really well. So. Okay, so we had a Canadian right now give us a little report. We're going to have a Canadian give ministry from the word. So, therefore, we're going to have a Canadian sing a special music number. So, this is what you can do the value of technology. So, let's see what we got here. Hopefully, this will operate just right. And usually it does if I do things the right way. So this is how we do this. George Beverly Shave from Canada. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> That someone you you may have loved strength your courage to renew do not be destroyed it is no secret what God can do Stumble, 
As you may know, after, Bill, after uh, George Beverly Shea, son, then the evangelist, Billy Graham, we get to the platform. Well, we have almost like a Billy Graham with us tonight. His name's not Billy, it's Brian, but uh, he'll do a, a good job with handling the scriptures. So, Brian, come on up and minister the word. Uh, George Beverly Shea makes that look easy, doesn't it? Uh, but uh, as they say, do not try this at home, right? Uh, it's, but he certainly was a gifted man, used of the Lord in a marvelous, marvelous way. There's a little assembly actually in the town that he was born in, and I think it's near his home, right? I think it's in Winchester, Ontario. The, the assembly, there's an assembly right there in Winchester and near the home that George Beverly Shea uh, lived in in, in uh, Winchester. Well, let's turn again in Psalm, Psalm 23, and uh, I see we've been upgraded to the uh, upgraded to the, the better screen here. So my goal is to get to the big screen up top. But I don't know if I'll get that this week or not, but uh, we'll, uh, for, for maybe next uh, maybe next conference uh, or another time we'll we'll get that get that far. Now, our, uh, we don't worry, I'm not going to take the whole time tonight, or at least the whole, the whole time tonight. We've heard a lot of things, so we'll, we'll condense the message tonight. I'm sure we've all had a big day. And, but let's take the time at least to read the psalm. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord uh, forever. So we've been working our way through these various Jehovah titles that are referenced uh, in Psalm 23. And so we, uh, we are now we've done the first four that, that appear there. And we have the uh, fifth one here, Jehovah, our righteousness, Jehovah, said, can you? And uh, it speaks of the Lord leading us in paths of righteousness. And uh, that uh, is, is a, is a, an important title of God, and it, it, particularly in connection with the believer and with our salvation. The first mention of this Jehovah title, Jehovah Sidkenu, or, or the Lord our righteousness, 
is found in Jeremiah 23 and 6. It reads this way, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And the first man that is said to be righteous in, in history is Abel. And Hebrews 11 and 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet uh, speaketh. But it's probably Abraham that we learn the most uh, of how a man was declared righteous. Genesis 15 and 16, it says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? And why is it important? Why is it so significant? Here we, we see it right at the very beginning of history. Abel, uh, the very dawn of history, so to speak, uh, is said to be righteous. And Abraham, one of the early uh, men of, of God moving in history, when he touched Abraham's life, it, it's pointed out that the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. And righteousness, I suppose, simply means uh, to be right or to be in a, uh, a right relationship with God. It, it is a standing uh, which results in righteous living. The standing affects our conduct, our living. We have a right relationship uh, with God. And, and the Bible's message of the gospel brings this out. The importance of having a right relationship with God. It seems that in, in, in recent years that the gospel has been blurred. And we have, as Christians, often embraced uh, sort of vague terminology that seems to obscure this vital uh, point. We are not naturally in a right relationship with God. We know that, right? Sin has entered. It has contaminated all of us. And we need to be put right. We are not naturally in a right relationship with God. But often you hear the gospel explained in ways that seem not to emphasize that, not to underscore that. We, we talk about, we hear messages about, uh, you know, uh, committing one's life to Christ, for example. Well, we maybe know what that means, or we think we know what that means, but that's not really the terminology that the Bible uses. That wasn't the message of the early apostles. Uh, that, that's not the whole uh, we might say theology of the gospel uh, as you go through scripture. It, it is not coming to Christ to sort of uh, maybe give you a better life or uh, maybe even help with your life's problems or uh, give you all kinds of wonderful things. It seems it, today we have many times obscured the message of the gospel, confused what we might call the byproducts of the gospel. In other words, there are certain byproducts. There are certain things that accompany believing the gospel and becoming a Christian. But the main product of the gospel is that it puts a man or a woman in a right relationship with God. It's because we need salvation is what we need. Uh, we don't just need some good advice. We don't just need some therapy. We don't just need a friend. Uh, we don't just need a goal. We need salvation. Now, I know you know all that. I'm talking about preaching to the converted. This is the uh, classic case of preaching to the converted. But the gospel tells us how we as sinners who are unrighteous can enter a right relationship with God. It seems to me that that, that emphasis is not as clear as it once was among us. In fact, we're so used to hearing a lot of these phrases, and we might in our own minds make the connection as Christians, but sometimes it's good for us to stop and listen, or stop and think, how would this sound to an unbeliever? Is there really a compelling reason to trust Christ? Is there really a compelling reason to trust Christ? Because the average person today might say, well, 
you know, actually my life's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm especially in living in, in the, the, this part of the world in which we've been. They might say, you know, I'm doing what, very well, you know, my job's good and this is good, that's good. And, you know, is there really a compelling reason to trust Christ? What would that do for me? What would that, how would that change my life? But, but if we drive home the point of the guilt of man and, and, and the universal nature of sin and the fact there is a holy God with whom we are not right, doesn't matter how well your life's going, that is not going to help you. And uh, perhaps we've lost that sense of gospel preaching. If you listen to the, to, to the how the apostles presented, how it was once presented, we were urged to come and put our faith in Christ as our substitutionary sacrifice for sin, that we needed a savior. We didn't just need some good advice. And so this idea of being righteous, as David said, he says here, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we'll just look and very, very quickly here and just sort of survey some of these main ideas that come out in the Bible as central to the message of the gospel. And we can rejoice in the fact that we who know Christ as our savior have that standing before God. And it has secured us uh, for all eternity. The Bible connects uh, righteousness with the term uh, justification. And that means God's work of declaring a person righteous. Henry Thiessen in his lectures in systematic theology writes, it will be seen that justification is a declarative act. It is not something wrought in man, but something declared of man. In other words, what he means by that is, it is God's statement that we are in a right relationship with him, that we have a right standing before him. And you might say, well, what's the significance of that? What's the point of that? That we are not saying that we are made righteous, but rather we are declared to be righteous a statement, an assessment by God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he justifies us, he declares us to have that right standing. We get the message from God himself. That is our claim. That is our authority to claim that we are saved because God has said we are saved and he has put us in that right relationship. This work of justification is connected with another salvation word, imputation. That means something is put to our account apart from our own effort. Something put to our account apart from our own effort. We might illustrate it this way. It, it would be similar if someone paid your credit card statement. Imagine getting your credit card statement and you've got all these charges that you spent on the month, and yet the balance is zero. And you notice that there's a, a payment of the full balance entered on the account, and it's cleared the account to zero. You think, well, I don't remember making that payment. How did that payment get made? A payment would be put to your account. And that is the idea behind being justified, or the word imputation, something has been put to your account. Paul uses this language in Romans chapter four, that when we come and put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the value of his death at Calvary's cross in dealing with the, with the guilt of our sin, the value of that is put to our account and it clears off all of our charges. That's what the forgiveness of sin is. That's what the, the removal of the guilt of sin is in our salvation. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 4. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, David was a particularly good example for Paul to use, wasn't he? Uh, these words are cited from Psalm 32. 
a psalm which I'm sure you're familiar with, where David describes his joy in knowing justification at a time in his life when he knew he was anything but righteous. After that dark period of his sin in his life, that dark, dark chapter of his life, and David went through that dark valley, but he still had hope in God despite the darkness, and he discovered that God would justify him. Blessed, he says, happy is the man who they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What relief that brought to David's mind. And of course, that's brought the same relief to our minds as well, as those who we know ourselves naturally to be guilty before God in sin. And yet in our salvation, all of our sin has been uh, removed. These paths of righteousness that David speaks about here in Psalm 23, even though our experience in life is that we have been guilty of sin, justification means the remission of sins, the restoration to favor. David knew the joy of fellowship with God. We spoke about that this morning. He restores my soul. Soul. The imputation of righteousness or to have a right standing before God. Blessed or happy is the man to whom the Lord will not uh, impute sin. Now that's gospel 101, right? And many of us grew up hearing gospel messages that would approach the gospel on that basis and would preach the gospel that way. We would emphasize the, the guilt of mankind, uh, the, the nature of sin. Uh, the seriousness of sin, the judgment is going to fall on sin, and our need of a Savior. And I would suggest to you, we seem to have lost somewhere along the line the emphasis of that in the gospel. And we perhaps would do well to return to it and encourage uh, younger men, particularly who are, are, are starting to preach, to restate these gospel truths with clarity and accuracy else we lose the message. We have a tremendous heritage. As Sam was talking about Gospel Folio Press, it was one of many that had a tremendous heritage with a crystal clear uh, grasp on the essential nature of the gospel and gospel preaching was clear and it was powerful and many people were saved and assemblies were growing and they were large and conferences were large and, and, and there was tremendous uh, growth among God's people in general because we were clear on the message of the gospel. And we need to come back to that and not have a watered down uh, message. Now you'll notice the critical element of this is can, can, uh, that is repeated continually as Paul develops it in the book of Romans. He emphasizes again and again that this is without works. This is without work. Paul is continually hammering away at that in the book of Romans. Of course, he was up against the popular thinking of the day, particularly among the Jews who had misinterpreted uh, their own law. And many of them clung to the idea of following their law obeying their law, and this would earn them favor, this would earn them a right standing before God. And from that, of course, Christendom in general has embraced the idea, and many people today, if they have any kind of spiritual uh, uh, thinking at all, if you were to ask them, I think I mentioned the other day, if you ask the average person, can I get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, uh, a lot of people would say yes, they think that's what the Bible teaches because Christendom that has that has corrupted the message of the gospel like the Jew has embraced a religion of good works but Paul hammers away it's without works without works without work it is the Lord who is our righteousness it doesn't come from within it doesn't come from our own effort the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ uh, our Lord Romans, Romans chapter 4, again, 
What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And he's making the point there, right? That, that, that if a person uh, is, is, uh, is getting uh, something as a result of their work, you go to work for a time at the end of the pay period, you are getting your pay. Well, that pay is not a, a gift, right? You've earned it. Your employer owes you that. You've earned it. You've done your work according to the agreement of your employment, and now you're entitled to that pay. And the, and the payment of that, uh, the giving of that payment is the settling of a debt that your employer owes you. Uh, and Paul says that's not the gospel. Uh, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. It's not grace. It's not a gift. That's debt. But to him who worketh not, Apart from works, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And Abraham's workless righteousness proves to be a model for all mankind. This was one of the, the many things God teaches us through the life of Abraham, a very important man uh, in the Bible. Furthermore, consider Paul's words again, Romans 4. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So here Paul emphasizes that uh, the guarantee of our righteous standing before God, uh, that it's made sure on the basis of faith. It's both available to all and it is secured in its very nature. The very nature of our salvation itself uh, is security. And any other way of attaining righteousness uh, would limit the availability of our salvation and puts its security at risk. In other words, if salvation was on the basis of works, it would limit its availability. For people that couldn't do the works, could not be saved. It would also limit its security. Because if we fail in our works, if we discontinue doing the works, our salvation would fail. But the very essence of the gospel, the very essence of our salvation, God insists, Paul insists, the scriptures insist absolutely it is without works or the entire uh, the, the entire thing uh, fails. Now we shouldn't limit this idea of our righteousness as being only some kind of a, a legal standing in God's court. And sometimes the book of Romans is looked at that way. It's compared a lot to legal processes. And in fact, the idea of God as the judge, the idea of God de declaring the one who is guilty uh, to have a right standing. There are certain sort of parallels and similarities to judicial systems and court proceedings, but they are limited. It is not a complete comparison, for there's another dimension of this that is important to understand. Again, we go to Paul, Galatians 3 and 29. If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. And because you are sons, God has sent forth this, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. What does that mean? It means we are a son. It means there is a, a relationship with God. If I were to go into a courtroom, having been charged with a crime, and even found guilty of that crime, but the judge, for whatever reason, 
finds a legal maneuver, or perhaps I have a, a representative attorney who finds a legal a maneuver to find me declared not guilty, if that such a thing could happen. Of course, I would leave the courtroom a very happy man, right? But I would leave the courtroom and that would be the end of it. I would have no relationship with that judge. I would have no, no, no uh, anything of life in me. It's simply merely a legal proceeding. It's over and done with. I'm happy for it, but it's merely a temporal situation. But in God's court, shall we say, this declaration of righteousness is not merely a mechanical kind of a thing, a legal kind of thing, even a philosophical kind of thing, but rather it provides for us a relationship with the living God of heaven. Having been given a standing of righteousness, declared to have a right standing before God, it opens the door to a relationship, a living relationship with God. All this flows from the righteousness put to our account by the Lord, our righteousness. And so David says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, there are many more ideas that we could look at in connection with this, but just one to, uh, one to close with here. That is, since we are have been declared righteous to have a right standing before God, it follows that that should characterize our life and that we are called as individuals having been given this gift to now go out and live righteously. Not that we would earn our salvation, nor even to keep our salvation, but it is the natural outflow, it's the logical outflow of the dynamic change that has taken place in our lives. Our psalm says, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That is to say, our walk, our pathway, the pathway of life, paths of righteousness, should be a well-worn path of righteousness. And here are some New Testament confirmations of this truth. Philippians 1 and 11 being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Philippians 3 and 9, being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. 1 Timothy 6 and 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. 2 Timothy 2 and 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the, on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's the scripture that instructs us in practical righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. We know that. For reproof, we know that. For correction, we know that. And the last one, for instruction in righteousness. And righteous living in an ungodly world will not always be easy. It will not always be easy. It won't always get approval. It won't always get applause. Peter writes, First Peter 3, 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And uh, it's not always easy. And we need to be praying, particularly for the younger generation. You know, the world, many of us grew up in an era when we could say Christian ethics were considered politically correct. If you remember back to your younger days. And we know many of the institutions and things, you know, Public ceremonies were often open in prayer or dinner. Someone would pray and uh, Bible was, was read in schools and things like that. Now, that doesn't mean that all those people of that era, all those people that work in schools and corporations and government were Christians. Many of them were not. They really weren't genuine believers. But it was politically correct. It was just considered good manners, right, to do that kind of thing. Well, those days are long gone. 
and our young people, our young adults now that are getting into responsible positions in government, in education, in corporations, uh, fulfilling jobs, are now confronted with the most of ungodly ideas that are becoming institutionalized, right? Uh, we've seen it. Well, what, what, what? Uh, imagine, uh, uh, imagine a, uh, a a young person today. If you can think about it, a person working for a corporation, uh, say they're in the marketing department uh, of, of a corporation. Say uh, a company like Target Department Stores. Now, about a year ago, Target Department Stores would be planning their summer and spring merchandising efforts for the following year. So a year ago, September, they're thinking about June, 2023. And some, some Einstein comes up with the idea, let's get a line of pro LGBTQ merchandise and merchandise this to children. Now imagine if you were working for Target Department Stores in the marketing department as a Christian. What would you say sitting around the room? It'd take a very courageous man or woman to speak up and say, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think our customer base would appreciate that. And as speaking as a Christian, this offends a lot of Christian people. Just purely from a business standpoint, it's a dumb idea, right? But in the environment, the, the politically charged environment today, that would take a very courageous person to do that. That's the kind of thing our young people are facing today. So we need to pray. Now they've been brought at such a time as this, right? This is when they're living. This is the era. And we need to be praying that they will stand for, ungod for godliness. But if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Some of them are going to suffer. Some of them are going to be demoted. Some of them are going to lose their jobs. Some of them, if they don't toe the line, they're going to find themselves in great difficulty. But the Christian is called to stand for righteousness. Now, on the other side of that, at our stage of life, we might say, as we interact with people, doing acts of righteousness can be a tremendous uh, uh, vehicle for promoting the gospel, right? This kind of good works living among doing good works for people. It, it sort of stuns them because it's not that common. A story Sam told about uh, Bill Pell taking that man, willing to take him to his house and his uh, uh, when he was out hitchhiking, these kinds of things for people, showing an interest in people, being kind to people, appreciating people, it, 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 it's in stark contrast with the tension and hostility that exists in society today, that it can be a vehicle for us to be witnesses in the gospel. And finally, eternity will be characterized by righteousness. Second Peter 3 and 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth where in dwelleth righteousness, dwells righteousness. Uh, that is that is going to be the norm. That is going to be the governing character of life. It is the righteousness that will be vindicated in the consummation of human history. Revelation 19 and 11. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. He does. He doth judge and make war. That will be the final end of human history. It will be vindicated. We now, by faith in advance, agree with that. We embrace that. Have found that in our salvation. And as David said, He leads me in paths of righteousness. Jehovah said, "Can you, the Lord, our righteousness?" Father, how thankful we are for salvation. Uh, that reached down and it provided for us. We could not save ourselves. We could not ever hope to save ourselves. And yet it has all been provided in the provision of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has taken a fallen humanity, rebels guilty of sin, and yet found a way that God could righteously and justly give us a status of a right standing before God, guilty as we were in our own right, and yet without compromising anything of God's holiness or righteousness, a way has been found whereby the lost can be saved. And so we all rejoice tonight as Christian believers in, in the, 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 the blessing that comes through knowing Christ. Help us to live it out, Father, uh, in our own set of circumstances, wherever we might be in life. 
to live out this righteousness and convey the wonderful message of the gospel as a living testimony to the transformation that has taken place in our lives through what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. Ask thy blessing on us now as we finish and for the evening uh, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, thank you, Brian. We appreciate all those insights. Wonderful to see how uh, all the names of God are represented there in Psalm 23. That's a great, great series and great study. Okay, well, we had a great day today, a full day with lots of activities. Um, the uh, avenue, once again, is open. You can fellowship right here, enjoy, or go back to bed nice and early and get a good night's sleep, whatever you want to do. Uh, the uh, options are all available to you. There are games uh, over here, and some are probably playing games, uh, have games in the avenue as well. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing each one tomorrow morning. Once again, there is a prayer time at 7.55 over in the foyer area, and then 8.30, of course, is breakfast. Okay, well, have a good evening.